Among thy mountains did I feel the joys of my desire. And she I cherished turned her wheel beside an English fire. Today we're going to read, I walked among unknown men. I traveled among unknown men, rather. And we're going to talk about what a ballad is, and this poem by Wordsworth, why the Romantics, and particularly why Wordsworth was so interested in this. And of course, we're going to be talking about why you should care. One of the purposes of the podcast is to give you an awareness of the historical context, enough of an awareness, because so much of these authors are writing a universal truth, or they're, they're trying to achieve a universal truth and understanding, but they are also writing in a particular period that is very different than ours. So, for instance, this poem, I Traveled Among the Unknown Men, is our second poem of the Lucy series. Now, it's not usually considered the second poem, you know, in the Lucy series, but it's the one that I'm going to be reading. And I chose it for a couple of reasons, but I think it helps us get a little bit deeper into what Wordsworth is trying to accomplish. So we have a tall order today, but I think we can do it in a relatively short amount of time. But there are going to be three things I wanted to read to you and we want to discuss them a little bit, each one. The first one is going to be a ballad. So I'm going to, uh, not a whole ballad, a short ballad, but I want you to get a taste for a traditional ballad because when some, if you were to like Google, for instance, ballad right now, you might actually see something like um, The Lady of Shallow by Tennyson, which is a ballad, but it's actually a more intellectual new version of ballads. The traditional ballads were sung by troubadours. This is the Troubadour podcast. Go to troubadourmag.com. But this is the, uh, you know, a singing minstrel that was just, you know, on a horse or walking through towns. And he would sing these traditional songs. It was kind of a a Homeric, you know, Homer going around and, and reciting the Iliad to each different sound. Except these are short, very concise, and they're usually sung. And that's, you know, you can go to YouTube and there's some interesting recreations of ballads from these troubadours that and in the music that we we think that they can be they might be have been played in. So here's a, a quick little ballad. So we're gonna do ballad. We're gonna read uh, I have traveled among unknown men, which is a short poem. And then we're gonna also read a comparison poem by Robert Browning, who came a little bit after Wordsworth, but he's also romantic. And I think he's this this is one of the reasons why there's so much misconception about romantics. Before I read these, here's one important thing for you. And I think this is going to make it a little bit more tenable as to why this is so critical to you, why this should matter to you. In the preface to the 1805 um, lyrical ballads, Wordsworth wrote, A great poet ought, to a certain degree, to rectify men's feelings, to give them new compositions of feeling, to render their feelings more sane, pure, and permanent. So when we think about what it is that poetry does, it orders, gives light, gives words to the... uh, the fuzzy emotions that we all experience all the time. We're often going through life and experiencing something and we give it some broad word like happy or joyful. But often it's the the truth of the psychological truth of what's going on in our minds is much more complicated. So for instance, the Lucy poems, many, many biographers, many biographers, hundreds of biographers since the time of Wordsworth himself, or or close to that area, have thought they understood what the who the Lucy poems were, what they meant. They all have different theories. We went into some of this in the the last one, last uh, Sunday for the Sunday morning poetry, and you know whether they're right or wrong, it doesn't really matter. Coleridge, who was a friend, who was the very close friend of, and a very influential human 
a, a, a philosophy critic, poet guy of the era, said this about Wordsworth and Lucy. He said that Lucy might have been, might have been, he didn't say this was a definite thing, might have been something that Wordsworth was experience, experiencing as a um, imaginative fancy about his sister possibly dying. And some historians have thought maybe, oh, well, he wanted his, he wanted his sister to die because at the time he had traveled to Germany with Coleridge. Coleridge had more money, so he went to this college town and he lived there and he was learning German. He was learning all the German tales and how to read German, how to speak German. And Wordsworth, who was who didn't have as much money and was burdened to some, you know, quote unquote burdened by his sister, and um, they were in the, another part of uh, Germany, which was mu much more removed. And then they got hit by the biggest winter, the coldest winter in a hundred years, basically. And a lot of his poems, in, in particular the Lucy and Matthew poems, but many poems were written in this period when he was isolated, he didn't know anybody, he didn't speak the language, and he was separated. And so some people have hypothesized that perhaps he kind of fantasized about what, you know, his sister's death, and that there was also an underlying realm of guilt there. And but this is also this is something that's very real. Like we often, I think we we tend to not acknowledge our own emotions. And that's one of the reasons why we need to, this is one of the reasons we need poetry is to acknowledge the emotions that are in there in order to look at them and say, that's not the best. We need to push that away because these hidden emotions have a tendency to burst out in very negative ways, which we don't want. We want to be able to explore the psychological truth and Wordsworth, you know, next to, um, you know, in the, in the um, classical poets, Wordsworth, Shakespeare are some of the greatest poets at doing this. And of course you have some ancient Greeks. This is why Freud talks about them all the time. So this is, this is what's very important for you is that what Wordsworth is trying to do with all these Lucy poems and all his poems really for the most part is he's trying to help you compose. Think of yourself as writing out, you know, like a, like composing a letter or a com like a composer writing a, a musical statement. He's trying to order the emotions in your mind. And he's trying to help you give, he's trying to give you the tools to do that. And that's what poetry does. I mean, I'll just, before we read the poem, I'll say this last thing. Today, we live in a time, an era of therapy. This is the therapy era. Everybody goes to therapy. There's nothing wrong with going to therapy, but a therapist can never, they can only help you with your inner voice. At the end of the day, you are the one who has the inner, it's your inner voice and you need to take control of it. So to some degree, we all need to become our own best therapists to the best of our abilities. That's not to say don't go to a therapist. A therapist can help you become your own best therapist, but so can poetry. Okay. So let's look at, you know, first we're going to talk about ballads so you can get a little bit of a context of what this is happening because the this uh, I Traveled Among Unknown Men is a kind of a, a, an intellectual, what's called a literary ballad. And he's choosing this for a reason. And by the way, all these ballads like Tennyson, they all happen after Wordsworth. Wordsworth and Coleridge, but particularly Wordsworth was the first. It was his uh, experiments. He was the master and the creator of the Romantic movement. And when we read Robert Browning, you're going to see why there's so much confusion about what Romanticism is because there are lesser romantics coming after Wordsworth trying to, you know, go, you know, inspired by him maybe in good ways, but not doing as efficient a job as he does. So here's a ballad, you know, just for the, t uh, the taste of it a little bit, or for the sound of it, I'm not going to um, sing it, obviously, but I'll, I'll give you a little taste. I'm, I'm looking at a little uh, website here. This I just googled this to find some random ones, but here's here's a popular Scottish ballad. So here it goes. Um, there was a lady of the North Country, lay the bent to the bonny broom, and she had lovely daughter, daughters three. Fa la 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 fa la 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 ra he re. I told you I'm not going to sing this. There was a knight of noble worth, which also lived in the north, the knight of courage stout and brave. A wife he did desire to have. He knocked at the lady's gate. 
one evening when it was late. The eldest sister let him in and pinned the door with a silver pin. The second sister she made his bed and laid soft pillows under his head. The youngest daughter, the same, that same night, she went to bed to his young knight. And in the morning, when it was day, these words unto him she did say. Now you have had your will, quoth she. I pray, sir knight, will you marry me? The young brave knight to her replied, Thy suit, fair maid, shall not be denied. Now, this goes on for many, many other um, stanzas, but I, I just wanted you to get a sense for the kind of rhythm the young brave knight to her replied, Thy suit, fair maid, shall not be denied. So there's a rhythm to it, there's a meter, there's a sound to it. This can be sung if, you, if you're a singer. I'm not going to try it. And, um, you know, but the point is that you could, I just wanted you to get a taste for what that was like, um, you know, and what's, what's going on here. And now, so, so that's a ballad. It's a story and it's, you know, so there is a story going on and it goes on and on and on, you know, and so a ballad is a poem or song narrating a story in short stanzas, often with unknown authorship. And in fact, Lyrical Ballads in 1798 was published without the author's names for that reason. That was one of the many reasons they did that. So last week, if you were listening then, if you weren't, it's okay, but I, you know, try to, try to keep up. It'll help, I think, to get a full view of all five Lucy poems. Uh, but if not, it's okay, stick with me. But last week we did, She um, Walked Among Untrodden Ways. And that was the, the one of the first of the Lucy poems. And one, one of the important things that we got out of that was the idea of the feeling of your, you know, your a lover dying. So death is something that's very important. And I want you to know that before we go into this. And also when we talk about Lucy, Lucy probably did not, was not an actress. There probably wasn't a real Lucy. In fact, Lucy, the word, the, the name Lucy was very commonly used during the 18th century in literature for a love, a, de a dead lover. So this is a common thing. And he was just, I think, plucking that out. Now, why he plucked that theme out, why that subject was so important to it, to him, who knows? I mean, he's an imaginative person. Maybe there's something going, you know, where he is looking around and there's a feeling where he wants his sister dead, or he feels this imagination because he feels burdened by her. That's possible. But that's, you know, in my view, he, neither here nor there in the reading of these types of things, in, in the reading of this. Okay, so let us read this, and then we will um, go through it a little, you know, quickly, and then I want to compare it to um, the Robert Browning poem briefly, and then we'll wrap it up. So again, we're going to be doing several of these. I just want to touch on a new kind of idea each time. So I tra here's, here's the poem. I traveled among unknown men in lands beyond the sea, nor England did I know till then what love I bore to thee. Tis past that melancholy dream, nor will I quit thy shore a second time, for still I seem to love thee more and more. Among thy mountains did I feel the joy of my desire, and she I cherished turned her wheel beside an English fire. Thy mornings showed, thy nights concealed, the bowers where Lucy played, and thine, too, is the last green field that Lucy's eyes surveyed. So, one of the ways to read poetry is to recognize that Often the key to understanding the individual stanzas, if you're watching on Facebook, that's these, you know, four lines grouped together here, is by reading the whole thing. Now, one of the reasons that Wordsworth in particular is interested in ballads and in, in a particular type of ballad, so he, he matches the rhythm, the rhyme, the meter of it, in order to capture that feeling that people may have in hearing. And, and people might have heard or very likely have heard somebody sing a ballad. I mean, it's like singing a rock song, right? Like people have, or a country song. 
people have a, a sense for this kind of rhythm and, and rhyme and meter. And so he's choosing this on purpose to, to convey something and to capture a feeling, but he's doing something very special with it. And Wordsworth's poems sometimes, and this is why I think he's so great, they sometimes seem so plainly presented that their artistry escapes us. And when I read the Robert Browning, you'll see that there's so much more imagery, metaphors, visuals than this. There's, there's, it's stocked with that. This has very little of that. There's very little, you know, I mean, there's the verb, uh, you know, there's the, the uh, subject I, the verb traveled. You have a visual unknown men, which isn't even a clear visual. You have in lands beyond the sea. You have England, which is a place on a map. Really, it's not, I mean, it's a place, it's a geography, but it's much more conceptual. I mean, you know, you're in England, you don't really see it except on a map, right? So it's very broad. You don't see it. It's not like looking at a lilac, a thrush, a nightingale, a, fla a fairy fla or a flower, a tree, a bowery, you know, a bedsheet, a, a rug from Persia. I mean, there's so many visuals he could use and he doesn't, right? He, he, so he's actually a little bit more abstract, so he travels, this narrator in stanza one, what we get out of this is that the narrator travels to some place. And it's always a question we're going to have to come back to is when is this happening? At what time period? So try to keep that in mind. But So the man in stanza one has left England behind, you know, for whatever reason. Well, we know at the end that someone has died. Perhaps that's the reason he, he left behind. So, you know, simply the narrator goes abroad, which gives him a deeper love for his homeland, Britain or, or England. In the second stanza, tis past that melancholy dream, that, you know, melancholy like a sad dream, nor will I quit thy shore a second time, for still I seem to love thee more and more. So, you know, leaving the shore of England was a sad dream or maybe a memory of some sort. And he will grow, um, or he will never again leave the city or the, the, the country. With every day, he seems to love it more and more. Now, again, we're going to have to come back to this and think about time and how memory and, and you know, is this a memory? Is this, when, when is this happening? And we'll, we'll play on that a little bit in a minute. And then the next stanza. Among thy mountains, so thy is your, among your mountains did I feel the joy of my desire. Now that's a kind of paradoxical and, you know, interesting way of saying something. The joy of my desire. And she I cherished turned her wheel beside an English fire. So it was in England that the narrator felt the joy of a desire. Uh, so th we, we kind of, I mean, one way to think about this, since we know it has to do with the lover, is being in love with love. Right, the feeling of experiencing something and being addicted to the feeling of that thing, and that the feeling of it brings you joy. And there is something profound in that, and there's a danger in that, of course, but there's something profound in the idea of loving love, of of love, you know, only loving the feeling of something and chasing that feeling, which, you know, in a really negative way can lead to something like drugs, right? Chasing this high all the time. But in other ways, it also could just mean you know, the joy of my desire, just relishing in your own emotions. And this is something that was very Wordsworthian, is relishing in your emotions, all of the chaos of your emotions, becoming comfortable in chaotic emotions. And that's something that's very important in life, I think, because you can't really control or predict the life around you. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of the stoic way of going about it, which is to train yourself to have all these negative uh, uh, emotions and be ready for them. Instead, I'm much more a fan of controlling and mastering and understanding the infinite complexity of your own psychological emotions. And so is Wordsworth. Wordsworth understands that the emotion you feel today is a byproduct of the thoughts, conclusions, observations you had yesterday. And so we're going to start to see this. This is starting to happen because now he's combining his 
the, the love that he has that we saw in the first two stanzas for England. So we saw that there was this, you know, um, I traveled among unknown men. I went to this, you know, this place where I didn't know the men. And if you think of it literally, it could be him in Germany. So he's in Germany. He's in the land beyond the scene with these unknown men. He doesn't speak the language. And, you know, he's missing England. It's very simple. You know, nor England did I know till then what love I bore to thee. It's like, oh, I didn't know how much I loved you until I loved you. Tis past that melancholy dream. What does that mean? Okay, so we'll, we'll get back to that. Nor will I quit thy shore a second time, for still I seem to love thee more and more. Among thy mountains did I feel the joy of my desire, and she, I cherished, turned her wheel beside an English fire. So again, there's a, there's a mashing up now of the mountains of England and the wheel being turned, you know, which is a, so, you know, a think of a sewing wheel, a spinning wheel, even the wheels of fate, because we learn, of course, that the you know the ancient Greeks had a myth that the there were three uh, muses that were uh, these old women who were spinning their wheel and that was your fate and that when they plucked that that was when you died so th that's fate the three fates and so she represents this to a certain degree and of course we know that she dies and she's beside an English fire this is a hearth this is home last stanza thy mornings showed. Thy nights concealed, the bowers where Lucy played, and thine too is the last green field that Lucy's eyes surveyed. So she's a surveyor, right? A surveyor is, so this is an interesting uh, word choice, of course, for a verb, is a surveyor, a surveyor is somebody who goes out and gets the, the size of a mountain. They go around and look at, you know, they make maps, essentially. And she's not that kind of surveyor, we, don't, we assume, but she did survey this, the, this place. This is the place that she saw. So we, we get this kind of metaphor here, the light of morning reveals, and we, you know, that's a simple, very simple metaphor. Remember we talked about how simple these things can be with Wordsworth, but how it represents something so profound when you put it together. And what he's, you know, again, he's trying to use the language of men, but he's also trying to put it into an imaginative way to help us understand our own inner emotional landscape. And the dark of night conceals the trees where Lucy played. So we know this. And you notice these past tense, concealed, Lucy played. So she played. We, we should be, we're kind of getting foreshadowing that, uh oh, she doesn't play there anymore. It's not where, it's not like he's far away on a trip. And he's thinking about my, my lovely Lucy at home playing, right? The, the present per progressive verb, play, where Lucy was playing, or where Lucy is no doubt playing under a bower. No, that's not what's happening. And then he says, and thine too, and, and here too in England is the last green field, field that Lucy's eyes surveyed. So remember, we have this combination of England or being homesick meaning something to this narrator only because of the loss of this loved one. And it is a, a good question, you know, and again, remember what we we're talking about with what Wordsworth understands philosophically that most poets, most people don't understand, is that emotions are not a random byproduct of your thoughts on something. Emotions are a by they they have causes and Wordsworth talks about this in in his preface and in various places that there is a cause to it and the cause is your previous meditations he would put it or in other words not meditation in mm, you know sitting in it with your cro legs crossed and going om but in meditation as in thinking about something observing and con coming to conclusions reasoning out in your mind. And he was actually a big fan of reason and philosophers who were rationalists. The problem was he didn't have a philosopher who had a good understanding of reason. That philosopher didn't come for a couple hundred years. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but there is still something that he, he um, you know, he, he still does understand there's a cause and he's struggling to understand what causes these emotions and how to order them. And that's what he's attempting in these types of poems. So, 
you know, why is it that we love some spot of ground? What is it about a spot of ground? Is it just like national heritage? For this narrator, a spot of ground takes a more takes on more feeling because the woman he loved once looked on it. Now, if you remember in a previous poem, uh, we did The Fountain and several uh, Sunday morning poems earlier, several weeks ago, we discussed the line, the wiser man mourns less for what age takes away than what is left behind. Memories are left behind when someone dies. Someone dying is someone being taken from us. The wiser man mourns less for what age takes away, death, than what is left behind, memories. And he's playing on that because he's trying to understand where is that moment when you fall in love with England? What does that mean? And it ha- it's wrapped up in the mountains that we see in England. It's wrapped up in the seashore. It's wrapped up in a, you know, a melancholy dream. It's wrapped up in a woman by an English fire turning her wheel. It's wrapped up in the mornings that conceal his lovely Lucy playing in the, the trees of England. And it's wrapped up in the eyes that she surveyed, which are no longer open because she's dead. And now she's buried in the land. This is the land where the narrator fell in love. That tree they had their first kiss in. Over in that bower did they hide from a sudden downpour of rain. There, on a hike, they had a f- their first big fight. And there, on the other side of that mountain, they had their makeup sex. This is the joy of his desire. A desire for a lost woman. But it's a joy that he felt. That's what's left behind the memory. And then, of course, the guilt that he feels a joy. Right? There's, a, there's a combination in all those things. Here in England, Lucy made a home. And this is where Lucy died. This is still her home. And he looked on these green fields. And if I look on them, it's as if I'm seeing her alive again. That's what he feels. Now, there's a lot that goes on here. And you have to, especially with Wordsworth, but this is true in most good poems, great poems especially, is that you have to think about the totality of the poem. So, you know, you might be asking where I'm getting all of this. How am I doing all of this? And it's, you know, in terms of assessing all everything. And I'm just looking at the conclusions of a dead woman. And I'm just thinking of it literally. There's a dead woman. And then I'm going back to the beginning and I'm thinking, well, what is that? What is, I traveled among the unknown men in lands beyond the sea, nor England's did I know till then what love I bore to thee. So did he not love the England until after his woman died, until after his lover died? Is that what he's saying now? So is this narration taking 20 years after the death of Lucy, and now he's going back and he's saying, man, I realize how much I love Lucy now that I'm gone and I'm in this terrible place with unknown man. Tis past, it is past, that melancholy dream. What's the melancholy dream? His love of Lucy? The love that he bore for England? No, this whole thing is a melancholy dream. Nor will I quit thy shore a second time. I'm never going to leave you again once I get back. For still I seem to love thee more and more. Okay, maybe he's not gone. Maybe he's there now. Among thy mountains did I feel the joy of my desire. So where's the joy of his desire? Oh, it has to, is it with England or is it with Lucy? Well, note that this happens, you know, almost as as close to the center of the poem as it can get. I mean, it should be one uh, line up or something to get to the dead center. But the point is that there is something in, you know, this is happening in this point, the joy of my desire is a combination of his joy, of his desire for England, his realization that he loves England, and his realization that uh, the reason he loves England is because he had a love that died there. And that is the emotion he feels when he looks on England's shore and he travels among unknown men. And, he, you know, that feeling you get when you're homesick. So the cliche way to deal with homesickness is to just say, oh, I'm so sad. But there's a whole world of complexity in your mind. And what he's doing is he's exploring, he's exploring that landscape. It's a world, it's a land. You can walk into this land of your own feeling of homesickness 
and trace every moment the mountains and the turning of the wheel. And you find out that it's this woman. And so the question for you is when you're homesick, when you're far away and you're in this land where you don't know the, the words people are saying, and you feel like this yearning for home, what is that yearning? What is it? What does it come from? Why do you love your home so much? Is it, you know, the, the simple way to just, is just to say, that's where I'm from and then leave it at that. But to really understand yourself, to know thyself is to go inward and to really ask, what is the cause for this narrator? What is the cause? You know, the answer is love for Lucy, that she is in her diurnal course is a word he'll use later, which is she's ground up in the earth. She's buried in the earth and she's there. Her eyes surveyed this. If he goes to that mountain, he can look out under their bower into the mountains and see exactly what they saw when they were young lovers. And so he is part, she is part of him and she is there always. And that's an experience that he can have with her. So it's his love for her that is the cause of this melancholy dream of this homesickness for England. Now, let's look at the poem quickly. I want to try to wrap up here in a few minutes. The poem by Robert Browning to see a lesser job of this. Now, this has a lot of great little images in it. It's It's got some great words to it. You know, I don't hate the poem or anything, but I'm going to have to get some of this ad. I was trying to get the ad out of there. But we do see... Um, we, we will see a very cliche view of this narrator who's just in love with England because he's in love with England. This is the level that most people, this is a slightly better version than what most people can read out of, uh, you know, out of their own psychology. So when asked, why do you love America? Why do you love Britain? Or why do you love Mexico where you're from? What is it? Oh, you know, it's the blossom trees and there's these cool bridges that I like to go on. You know, they can come up with a list of things and it's just a random list of things. What Wordsworth did in, in four quick stanzas is he ordered a whole psychology of a single emotion and traced it in a rhythm to, you know, in a rhyme to this idea of the death of Lucy and how that shades everything and combines with his love of England. Okay. So let's go really quickly through um, Robert Browning. Home thoughts from abroad. Oh, to be in England, now that April's there, and whoever wakes in England sees some morning unaware that the lowest boughs and the brushwood sheaf round the elm tree bowl are in tiny leaf, while the chaffinch sings on the orchard bough and England now. And after April, when May follows, and the white throat builds, and all the swallows, hark, where my blossomed pear tree in the hedge leans to the field and scatters on the clover, blossoms and dewdrops, at the bent spray's edge, that's the wise thrush. He sings each song twice over, lest you should think he never could recapture the first fine careless rapture. And though the fields look rough with hoary dew, all will be gay when noontide wakes anew the buttercup, the buttercups, the little children's dower, far brighter than this gaudy melon flower. So you can notice that this is kind of an overload of images for what he's trying to say here. Versus the simplicity of, you know, in the rhyme of, I traveled among unknown men in lands beyond the sea, nor England did I know till then what love I bore to thee. So this is, again, with Wordsworth, you have a very simple use of language. Here, you have a much more complicated use of language. Oh, to be in England now that April's there. And whoever wakes in England sees some morning unaware that the lowest boughs and the brushwood sheaf round the elm tree bowl are in tiny leaf, while the chaffinch sings on the orchard bough in England now. Now, this isn't terrible. I'm not trying to, you know, say that this is a horrible poem. It's actually not bad. But notice just the simplicity, even though there's more going on in a certain sense, 
or there's more concrete images as we have. Okay. We're in April and he's saying, Oh, it's, this, you know, so whenever you see something like, Oh, it's like an emotional thing. It's like, Oh, Oh, to be in England. <laughs> That's an exaggeration, but th you get the idea. Now that April's there and whoever wakes in England and they see some morning and they're unaware because they get to be in England at the lowest boughs. That's the branches on a tree and the brushwood sheaf. So it's a, a you know, I don't, I, I don't have a visual of that um, type of vegetation, but he, you know, he talks about elm trees with tiny leaves and uh, a chaffinch. I'd have to look up what a chaffinch is, some type of bird I imagine on the orchard bough. And then the next stanza and after April when May follows. So we get the sense that this narrator is far away. He's not at home. And he's, he's not only far away, but he's going to be gone for a while. And after April, when May follows, so this person that is lucky enough to be in England from stanza one gets to experience April and May. And the white throat builds. It's an animal. I imagine a, another bird. And all the swallows, birds. Hark. Hark means, hey, listen. Where my blossomed pear tree and the hedge leans to the field and scatters on the clover blossoms and dewdrops. So he's giving you all these imagery, images at the bent spray's edge, the spray of water. That's the wise thrush. He sings each song twice over. So he's telling you something about a thrush, another bird. Lest you should think he never could recapture the first line, fine, careless rapture. So this is like the rapture from the Bible, or the, the great rapture. So there is. this is why the thought of romanticism is you have this narrator, he's missing home, why does he miss home? All of these nature images. That's the reason. This is very different than the, the way that Wordsworth uses language for the inner psychological emotion. And this is why, you know, I think there's a big difference between what people mostly perceive as romanticism, which is like simply this love of nature. And by the way, Wordsworth loved nature. I'm not, you know, this, nature was a church for him but he's really interested in man as part of nature and understanding the psychology of that creature called man. And because you are that creature, it is worthwhile for you to also follow along and, and read Wordsworth. Wordsworth is going to give you a lot of information about yourself and he's going to help you order your own psychology. This is very important. And so my you know, for, for this lot, this episode, this, um, this particular Lucy poem, I traveled among unknown men. Think about homesickness. When was the time that you were homesick? What did it mean to you? What kind of things did you think about? What did it feel like? Can you bring up that emotion? Are you homesick now for some reason? Are you homesick? You know, are you, um, far away from home? And so you're, you know, and you're an adult and you're working somewhere, you're getting married and you feel something about your, your home that you first came back to. And I remember when I came back home when I was 30 and saw this tree that I had planted when I was a kid, and I, I posted this on my Instagram, which is Kirk J. Barbera is my Instagram if you wanted to check it out. I don't really do anything fancy with it. That, that, but that tree that I planted meant something to me, and it was an interesting feeling, and I didn't know how to put words to it. And this helps you kind of put words to it. The Lucy poems in general, and this one in particular, helps you feel what it's like to feel when you're among unknown men, when you're traveling among unknown men, which is what most of life is, right? Okay, so stick around or come back next week and um, please share th this uh, video if you like it. Go to troubadourmag.com. We're on Spotify, iTunes, you can anywhere. So if you just want to listen, you could go there, you know, share it. It really helps out. And, um, you know, also if you leave reviews it, on Facebook or on uh, Spotify, it really helps us uh, to grow and find new people. So I hope you enjoyed I Traveled Among Unknown Men, and we'll see you for Sunday Morning Poetry next week.